Stephanie is a public figure and she has a huge following across multiple social media platforms. She's even appeared on a reality TV show. She's someone who's really opened up to her fans online and shares a lot of personal details. You know, that's a really good point. It begs the question, when you share something online, how much information is too much? You know, if somebody saw one of her posts and said, okay, I think I know this person, where can she draw the boundaries? Right. I think our listeners will really benefit from her story. I never imagined that somebody would actually take things this far. I've gotten so many creepy comments, messages before, all over my YouTube, all over Instagram, but nothing quite to this degree. So I never could have imagined that, that this could happen to me. I'm Jamie Beebe. And I'm Jake Deptula. On today's episode of Strictly Stalking, we're chatting with Stephanie Matto, a YouTuber and author who formally starred on the TV reality series 90 Day Fiance. After receiving a series of disturbing comments on her YouTube channel, she initially brushed them off as creepy comments she sometimes gets online. She blocked the user and emailed her longer, more descriptive messages claiming to be her neighbor, revealing the actual address of her new apartment, and that he was watching her. He created several Google Voice numbers and sent Stephanie disgusting, perverted messages, and when she didn't answer, he became hostile and threatened to come down to her address. Now Stephanie is here to speak out about her terrifying ordeal and how she's fighting back against her stalker. Stephanie, thank you for joining us today. Of course. Thank you. When did you decide to become a YouTuber? I became a YouTuber, I think it's been about seven, eight years now. I never really had a huge group of friends and I always kind of felt like I had all this creative energy and I just wanted to channel it into something. So I created a YouTube channel and it's all kind of, you know, all evolved from that. How did the fans interact with you on YouTube? Honestly, I feel that throughout the years, I've been kind of a polarizing person. People either really like me or really don't. And I definitely attract a lot of, you know, interesting individuals to my channel. Um, I've gotten a lot of love, but I've also gotten a lot of hate. And then, of course, being a girl on the internet sharing her life, you do also attract a lot of attention from uh, lonely people (laughs) who are, you know, maybe sometimes don't understand boundaries so much. Are your fans mostly men or women? Um, It all depends on which social media network you're talking about. But as far as my YouTube channel goes, it's about 80 to 90 percent male viewership. How did you get involved with 90 Day Fiance? Um, so about early summer last year, I started talking to a girl that I had actually met through Instagram. And she had watched my channel here and there. And we became friends at first. And then things got more serious between us because we had both, you know, at that point broken up with our boyfriends. And we wanted to meet, we wanted to pursue a relationship. So we both decided to go on this show and document us meeting for the first time. And obviously I had, I I had thought it was going to be this magical experience, but it did not turn out to be that way. So, you know, it was one of those things where it was a really hard lesson and kind of disappointing, definitely a learning experience, but It's over now, thank God. I was a pretty controversial person, I think, on Before the 90 Days because a lot of the plot was based around the fact that I was this other person online that I didn't end up being in person. And there was a lot of pressure put on us because we were the first LGBT couple. And that was like a huge deal. And I felt like I had communicated to my partner about boundaries and about how, yes, I am this like sexy persona, this fun, sexy persona online, but you know, that's like surface level. Once you get down to who I really am, I'm actually a pretty like reserved, mellow, low key person. I think when I'm alone filming at home in front of a camera, I can be very extroverted. But, you know, in my personal private life, I'm more of an introvert. And I think that because we did not know each other very well, it came as a shock to her when I showed up and I was different than what she had expected. And I 
you know, partly blame myself for some of that miscommunication, but it does tie in to a lot of my past experiences in my life. Whenever people watch my channel or see me on social media, they get this impression of me and they expect me to be just like that in, in real life. And I think, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a bad thing. I don't feel like I'm being fake online, but I feel like being online is my creative outlet and it, and it allows me to be a certain way. And sometimes I can be sexy online and, you know, talk about certain things, but when the cameras come off, it's a little bit different. So yeah, you know, obviously if you watch the show, I definitely was not the best version of myself. And I wish I could go back and do things differently. I could have handled so many situations so much better. I was very toxic and just not somebody that I enjoyed watching. So now that I watch it, I'm like, okay, those are things I want to work on and fix. And those are things I'm working on. And also the show has made me value my privacy even more because I used to air a lot out on the internet about my life on my YouTube channel. And then once the show aired, I didn't really have control over curating what people see and what people don't. They kind of just edit it the way they want to. And they they put whatever they want. You have no creative control. So um, I think that, I think that, yeah, now I'm just so much more private. I think that going forward, I don't think I want to air my dirty laundry like that anymore. I, if I ever get into another relationship, I don't think I would want to even make it public. Do you ever think you'll do another reality show? I think I would do a reality show if it was like a game show or like something with, with dogs or like <laughs> something just, you know, very like neutral as far as I like, I wouldn't do something with a partner, with a relationship, because I feel like anytime you involve a show into a relationship, it can either make or break it. And, you know, I think had there been no cameras, had there been no show, I would have gone to Australia and me and her would have probably quickly realized that we were two very different people and then just shook hands and went our separate ways. But, you know, you've got lights, you've got cameras, you've got people there and it just kind of fuels that drama between you two and it amplifies every problem. So I, you know... (sighs) I think it wouldn't have it wouldn't have worked out either way, but I think it would have ended a little bit differently. How did your fans change once you were on 90 Day Fiance? I think that um, my Instagram following due to the show has definitely grown. I think my YouTube channel has mostly stayed the same. It is still a lot of men. Um, but a lot of men have also started following me from the show as well. So, you know, even with the show, you get people who are obsessive to a degree who don't know boundaries who will just like persistently message you to take you out or get your phone number and you know people on my social media are to a degree at this point aware that I have this ongoing stalker situation so when people cross boundaries like that and try to get my phone number or look me up and try to find my address it's kind of like come on guys like you know what I'm dealing with like why are you making me feel this way like I feel so uncomfortable I actually have had a few people who are fans of the show somehow find my address, my parents' address, and send them packages. And it like, you know, it's a sweet thought, I get it, but it feels weird, you know? And with me, I'm so ultra paranoid because of everything that's been happening to me the past three years that like, it's not a great feeling to know that there's people out there searching for private information about me and my family. So, you know, the show has opened more of that up too, which, it, it kind of sucks. What was your life like right before you met your stalker? What was going on? Um, before the stalker, I was kind of part of this group of YouTubers that would do story time videos on YouTube. And a lot of the time we would do very outrageous videos that were clickbaity and we'd exaggerate things a lot. And, you know, every YouTuber, oh, my stalker is following me. And like, you know, 
I lost my virginity and like just like crazy titles, crazy stories, right? And I would watch a lot of these YouTubers and I'd be like, oh, like, wouldn't it be great if I had a stalker too? Because then I could like make a video about it and, you know, it'd be something like cool to talk about. And, and now that I'm in the position I'm in, I think of that and I'm like, first of all, if someone has a stalker, like, why would they ever want to make a YouTube video about it? It's like, you don't you don't want to talk about it with anybody. You, It's not something to like capitalize off of. It's something that's really, really scary and can really truly mess up your life. So now I'm kind of just like slapping myself in the, in the face forever thinking that way. And I never, I never imagined that somebody would actually take things this far. I've gotten so many creepy comments, messages before all over my YouTube, all over Instagram, but nothing quite to this degree. So I never could have imagined that, that this could happen to me. When you got the first messages, what, what did you think of them? When he first started commenting, it was just like run of the mill, generic, creepy comments, nothing that really stood out to me too much. Uh, maybe they were just maybe a little bit more graphic than the usual comments, but I just kind of let it go because that's as, as a girl, that's what you deal with on YouTube. If you are even, I guess, you know, remotely attractive, then you're going to attract some kind of weird attention on the internet. And uh, I dismissed it, but they got really creepy at one point that I was like, ew, like this is this is not good. So I just blocked him from being able to comment on my YouTube channel. Um, but then shortly after the messages moved over from YouTube and into my email inbox. And in my email, they were much more descriptive and lengthy. I actually have some if you want me to read as an example. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I have a whole evidence folder from my uh, investigation that I'm doing with the police. They had me screenshot and collect everything. And it's like, once you really see it all, it just, it's disturbing. Steph, let's just cut to the chase. I find you so attractive, and I know my comments are rude on YouTube, but it's only because I just want to give you some amazing sex, make those pretty toes curl, give you something so exhilarating James, who was my ex-boyfriend at the time, uh, can't provide. I just want to eat your badge like a four course meal when you, yeah, I just, I'm not going to, it goes on like, it's like an entire paragraph of him like, going step by step of like what he would do to me. Um, and these types of emails would happen periodically. Um, and they were coming from an email with a fake name. But I knew that it was this particular person that was making comments on YouTube because, you know, he referenced himself. But also he has a really specific way of spelling and putting together his sentences that it's like very, very obvious when it's him. What was your first reaction when you started getting these emails? My first reaction when I started getting the emails was this person seriously disturbed. Um, but there is that like disconnect, you know, it could be anybody anywhere. It could be somebody in freaking South America, in, in Europe, in Africa. You don't know where they are. So... I don't think I was really afraid. I was just grossed out and also was just like, okay, well, you know, this just comes with the territory. I'm an influencer, so people are gonna leave me hate. People are gonna harass me, threaten me online. I just have to deal with it. Um, but then of course things proceeded to get even worse. How did it escalate from there? So about a year or so ago, I moved into a new apartment at the time. And um, this was in um, upstate New York area. And it was my first week moving in. And I just remember I was posting videos here and there on my YouTube channel, not really showing anything too specific, but I did show like a view from my window of the Hudson River. And I guess this person figured out where I was living based on those things. And I got an email from this creepy guy that's been sending me these very graphic, disturbing emails. And my heart dropped because 
it was the week that I moved in that he sent me an email with my address line in the subject bar of the email. And he wrote, OMG, my dream has finally arrived in the form of the goddess, which happens to be you. How can I get any better than the love of my life moving into the building I recently moved into two months back? How crazy is this? Will you start to stop ignoring me? What else can I do to have a normal conversation with you? And will you finally have met your mate? If I'm willing to deal with the level of crazy, let's face facts, all women have some sort of crazy. Difference is, what is the level of crazy might someone want to deal with? I know you're a strong, independent woman. I will never get in your way, but I will be there to emotionally uplift you, care for you, and make sure the little things I do will make your life easier, which will make you happy. Um, and at that point, I panicked because I now knew that this guy knows where I live. And it's probably because he also lives in the area. I didn't know if it was true that he lived in my building. Um, I checked with management. I showed them the email. And they said that this doesn't sound like anybody that lives there. Um, but then he actually proceeded to send me more emails saying that he's watching me through the windows and w would send me emails saying, like, I see you. I see you dancing around your apartment. You had your family over last week. Like, I saw that you were a little tipsy. And, um, yeah, like, needless to say, I spent a lot of time just, like, staring out the window thinking, you know, who could it possibly be? I would keep the blinds on the windows closed a lot because I was just so freaked out. Um, but it was a very small apartment building. So the odds of it being him were pretty low. But let me tell you, every single time I saw some dude in the elevator, I would just look at them like, is that you? <laughs> like, you know, I was like, what, who, like, who is this person? But, um, yeah, come to find out this person did not live in my building. Uh, but they did live in the area, which was pretty much like my worst nightmare come to life. Were you scared that this person was going to actually show up or reach out and hurt you? So at one point, they then stopped with the emails. And I don't know how, but they got my phone number. And they began to text me. And I would just proceed to block every single number and then they would just go and make a new one. So I think that they were using just like a Google voice phone number generator. So this would just go on and on. And there was like one evening where he texted me from like 10 different numbers. I kept blocking, blocking, blocking and telling him to stop. And he kept making new phone numbers and kept persisting and saying that, you know, he's gonna, he's the one to make me happy. You know, why don't I give him a chance? He even tried to like solicit me as a prostitute. He asked me if I could come to this hotel and he'd pay me like $500. Like just, it was so strange. It was so very strange. Um, and the one particular night that he made all these Google voice numbers insisting on being with me, uh, eventually he got really angry and threatened to come to my address. And he was like, you know, he stated my address in the text message and he was like, I know where you live. Like, I'll come down. Like, do you want to, like, I'll, do you want to see what'll happen if I come down? And that was the first night that I actually called the police because I was afraid. I lived in an apartment and I have two dogs and I walk them alone at night. And there are parts of that street that are kind of dark and scary. And so, you know, there were nights where I would walk my dogs and I would be looking over my shoulder constantly because I was so scared that he was watching me, that he was just gonna show up. and. So I called the police that night and they pretty much told me they couldn't do anything because I didn't have a name. All I knew was that this was somebody that lived in the area and I showed them the messages and, you know, city cops, they have other more important things to be doing. And I think that they didn't really take it very seriously. So they, you know, gave me a case number and they said, if you get any more updates, let us know. We'll update the file. But as far as what you're dealing with, we can't help you. They didn't basically give you any direction on how to deal with your stalker. No, because he was using all these like fake Google voice numbers. So it's not like you could even track him down. I even tried to do some of my own investigative work. And I would, I, you know, tried to look up his IP address from the emails he sent me. That didn't work because he was clearly using a VPN. So, you know, this guy was clever and definitely no stranger to this sort of stuff online. 
I don't think I was the only girl he was doing this to. I don't think I was the first or I'll be the last. Do you feel this could have been somebody within the YouTube community, maybe a competitor? No. And, you know, I also thought maybe it's like an ex or something, but I really, I really didn't think so. But, you know, he sent me, for example, this one message. Should I just pop up at your address? Stephanie is a good old soul. Yes, she is a pig's asshole. Steph, honestly, I'm frustrated because I really feel I would keep you so happy and so full of life and have you see life differently. You would forget about your condition. Oh, well. And like, I don't know anybody who writes like this. I, you know, this is clearly somebody who is maybe not the brightest person. I don't know. Um, but there was one night where I was getting so fed up, like he would message me like weekly from these weird ass numbers. And every time I saw a weird number with a weird area code, I knew it was him. And then I would read a few lines. And of course, you could just tell by the grammar, the you know, you 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 saw how he writes. It's like, he uses strange terminology that doesn't really make sense. And um, there was one night where I tried to kind of buddy buddy up with him, maybe try to get some information. And so I did manage to find out after him letting his guard down, that he was, um, that he worked at a flooring company. And I also got his first name. So I knew that he lived in my area and I knew his first name and I knew his type of work. So I did a lot of Googling and I just Googled his name, my area and flooring company and a Facebook profile popped up. And I clicked on the Facebook profile and I saw a man who, you know, was writing statuses that really lined up with the same type of sentence structure in these text messages. So I was fairly certain that this was the person that was sending me these messages. And they have a last name that kind of works as a pun as well. So as a joke, I wrote a pun as a text message using their last name. And I thought, okay, well, if it's him, it's going to be, he's going to freak out because he's going to see that I know his last name. But if not, he's just going to be like, oh, that's like a pun. It's a joke, whatever. So I, I wrote the sentence using his last name as a pun. And that's when he realized I had found out, I had figured out who he was. And that's kind of when he backed off. Uh, he actually apologized to me. He said, hey, I'm sorry, like, you know, that I've been making you feel this way. And he's like, yeah, you're much smarter than you look. And, you know, I joke with him and I said, ha ha, yeah, like, you know, just please don't do that again. Like, you've really made my life a living hell the past few months that I've been living here. Um, just don't do that again. And I kind of left it off, you know, we're good, we're cool, but just like stop and leave me alone. But I think he kind of maybe still thought that he could message me because sometimes he would still text me like these just – friendly text messages, nothing threatening or anything, but I wouldn't respond because I was like, dude, you, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, I'm not going to talk to you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it left off with that for a while. How did you feel when you first found out who he was? I was just confused. I mean, it was just some random person that literally just found my YouTube channel. Um, it was just bad luck, I guess. Just the wrong person stumbles upon my channel watches my videos and I talk about a lot of personal things on my channel so I guess it becomes easy for people to watch me and maybe feel like they're good friends with me or that they know me or that they might want to date me but you know the person that's online is a fraction of who I really am as a person so you know it's just it just sucks that this person had to find my channel and take things so far I you know and the worst case scenario is that the person lives nearby and of course they do they live like 20-30 minutes away from my new apartment and at that time I was looking to start fresh I was looking to start a new life I had just gone through a really bad breakup and I thought this was like you know gonna be my second chance at like finding love and being back within like the New York City area. I was feeling really positive. And then this happened and kind of clouded that entire time. This was before 90 day, but it also continued to happen 
after. And when I got back from Australia, it proceeded again. It kept happening more and more. And eventually it escalated and it escalated when I bought my new house and I moved away from New York. I moved back to near where my parents live. And, you know, I thought I was done with it. I thought it was over. He had kind of stopped messaging me for the most part. Um, Even the friendly messages had stopped. Like he had just kind of backed off and I was like, Oh, thank God it's over. He's, he's moved on. He's, you know, either stopped or maybe found another victim, God forbid, but who knows. Um, But then uh, one night I was here at my new house, my new address, and I got a text message. And in the text message was my address, my new address. And it was like two sentences and it was very, very cryptic. I mean, the sentences didn't even make sense. It was like a riddle. And I just had chills down my spine because I don't even know how he could have found this address like there there must have been way more digging involved this time the other address I kind of understand you know it's New York it's more easy to pinpoint where you are based on like your pictures and stuff but you know this I was like how the hell did this guy find my address um and so at that point, I knew his name, and I knew that he knew my new address. So that's when I called the police here in my town, and they have been able to help me. What was that like when you called the police for the second time? Calling the police the second time, I was a little apprehensive because I knew the first time they didn't really do anything. So a part of me was like, I'm just maybe wasting my time. Like They're just going to basically shrug it off and tell me to get a better security system or I don't know, get a gun or something. But I was so, so surprised. The police officers came in that night, they sat down with me, and we looked at the messages. And they seemed to take it very, very seriously. The police officer was actually frightened for me after looking at the messages that I was sent. And he said, you're not staying alone here tonight. You need to call your parents and we're going to stay at the edge of your driveway until we see your parents pull in. And I was like, wow, like, are you you sure that you guys want to do that? Like, and they were like, yeah, we insist. And I was like, oh, shoot. And, you know, this police officer that works at my town, he used to work in the private sector. So I guess he's dealt with some things with stalking. And so he said that like he's experienced these things. He knows how bad it can be and that this doesn't seem like some sort of joke or something to be taken lightly. So I think that was also the first time that I started to see it as something really serious because this cop seemed scared. Um, But I was also very grateful that they were taking it seriously. Uh, They said that they were going to uh, come back a few days later, and that we were going to make a statement and that they were going to open a criminal investigation against this person. But obviously, there's so many steps involved. How did you build your case against this stalker? I had to go back and basically compile an entire folder of every single message, comment, everything he's ever left me, which, you know, showing that to the police and then and then reading it out loud and making a statement it's just gross and just disturbing and you could tell the the cops were just so creeped out by it they were just like what the hell who is this guy and they were like how long has this been going on and i told them you know almost three years at this point and they couldn't believe it um i gave them the name of the guy they were able to find his employer they were able to do a background check on him and you know there is a, a violent past with this individual and it's it's a process, the criminal investigation, because you have to go through all of the legal steps. You can't just like show up at someone's house as a cop and just arrest them. You have to like, you know, have a search warrant and not just a search warrant for him, but for all of the different phone numbers. So to prove that it was really him, they have to take every single fake phone number he's ever made and do a search warrant on every single number. So the court has to approve every single number. So like this has been like, 
weeks and weeks on end of them just trying to pinpoint the guy that make sure it's the to make sure it's the right guy but basically it's almost a certainty that it is and uh even once these search warrants are are approved and they can put out an arrest warrant it's not in their jurisdiction this is back in new york so it's another loophole so you know it's not like hey i'm being stalked this guy's harassing me and like telling me he knows where i live and that he's gonna come by and go arrest him no it's like all this legal stuff that you have to do so it can be discouraging, actually. What are some of the things you found out about his previous record? Um, I can't really say what I found on his previous record, and I don't think even the police want to tell me in detail what it is. Um, but I can say that it is violent, and it has reinstated some of that fear that I've had in, in this whole situation because I always spent the past three years wondering where will this guy stop? Like, is what is this guy capable of? You know, at first I said, oh, okay, he's only capable of just sending me some YouTube comments, but then it moved to email, then it moved to text message. And, you know, it's like, where does it stop? And why is he doing this? Is it so he can feel powerful knowing that he scared a girl? Or is it because of some like sexual fetish that he has, or is he really looking to track me down? So I've actually shied away from talking about it anywhere on social media for a long time, because I felt that by showing my fear and frustration, it would be giving him what he wants. Was he still contacting you while you were working with the police and gathering this evidence? Uh, after the police were involved, he messaged me one more time. But then as the investigation got further and further and the police began to reach out to like the former employer and do some more background history work, I think he got, I think he got a little bit frightened because he hasn't messaged me since then. Um, I hope that there was some sort of wake up call for him that like people were on to him and that, you know, people were closing in on him. So, you know, I'm always like holding my breath and waiting for the next time he might reach out to me. And I have gone as far as to buy bear repellent spray <laughs> that I keep by my bed at night because I haven't, you know, thought about really getting a gun. I got the bear repellent and I also got an entire home security system. And the police officers in this town are really wonderful and have agreed to basically patrol my street every day. So every single evening I see the police car drive by and they like wave to me and they're like, is everything okay? And they kind of check on me too. So like if they see that my garage door is open, they'll like, they'll text me and they'll be like, Stephanie, like make sure your garage door is closed. <laughs> like it's, it's, very nice. I almost feel like I have 24-hour on-site security. To your knowledge, have you ever seen him in person? Um, No. I mean, now I know how he looks. So if I ever saw him, I would know it's him. But thankfully, I haven't. When he was sending you messages about knowing what you were doing, was that really what you were doing? Do you think he was actually watching? So there was one message that he sent me. I'm watching you, my sexy slutterina. That's a slut and a ballerina. We live in the same building on your second floor. I'm on third. I have a telescope pointed in your corner unit, my baby girl. I love seeing you, especially a couple weeks back when you had company. You looked a little tipsy. I enjoy seeing you and your dogs go when you're Porsche. God damn, you're fine. And then he wrote my address. And I was like, I mean, it's possible. I mean, it's possible he could have seen that because, yeah, I did have a few drinks. I have a few drinks every week. I mean, it felt very like general. It felt like he could have just guessed. He could have watched one of my YouTube videos and seen that last week I did have family over and that there was maybe wine on the counter. I think he's one of those like really perceptive people who can like pick pick out pick out things and make it seem like he's really watching me. 
I, you know, I want to not, I want to believe that he, that he wasn't watching me, but anything's possible. Did you report any of his initial comments to YouTube? I just basically reported him on YouTube, but then I guess YouTube does whatever they want. I, there's so many millions of people commenting on YouTube saying awful things that I don't think YouTube really takes that stuff very seriously. Because you are well known and you have, you know, some fame, do you think that this is just something that goes along with that? I think that having some kind of notoriety online definitely attracts both good and bad attention. I think everybody kind of deals with it who has a following. I've gotten messages from people. I've gotten mail from people that's been super weird. I actually recently got a letter from a prison inmate who wanted me to put money in his in his commissary account. <laughs> so like I just get the I just get the weirdest messages, the weirdest attention. And a part of me like blames myself. I'm like, oh like I bring this upon myself, but it's not good to believe that. It's not good to, you know, think that like I did this to myself. Like, no, I didn't make this guy do this you know I'm just putting myself out there online if anything it just teaches me maybe to keep more things private and be a little bit more cautious and to not you know ignore it for so long because for so long I just put it off and said oh maybe I'm just overreacting or maybe I'm just being a drama queen because everybody says I'm a drama queen so I'm like yeah I must be a drama queen but no I think this is a really serious situation and I'm glad that finally I'm handling it how I should have in the first place, which is legally. How many times did you file restraining orders against him? So I'm currently in the process of getting a protective order, but that relies on the search warrant, you know, going through and basically identifying that it's definitely him. So it's, it's like a process basically. Um, I, can't really get a restraining order just yet. How close do you think you are to proving that he's your stalker? I think probably within the next few weeks. What are the next steps for you in the legal process? I think the next steps would just be to get these search warrants done and then, you know, get an arrest warrant. Unfortunately, with all these messages, even though there's years of them and they are explicit and terrible. Uh, he can't really be charged with anything beyond a misdemeanor crime. So he's not going to go to prison, but he will probably face a fine and he will be arrested and brought to jail. And, you know, and, and that's the extent right now, but hopefully that's enough to scare this person. And, stop him from doing this to me, but maybe just doing it to somebody else too, because odds are he probably is doing this to other women online. It's not just me. And yeah, I mean, we'll see. Hopefully it doesn't escalate anymore. Hopefully we could just scare him straight and send him the message that I'm not putting up with this anymore. What point did you talk about this with your friends and family and what was their reaction? I hid this from my mom for about two years because my mom and I are really close and she's so paranoid about everything regardless of this situation. She's a total helicopter parent. So like she'll call me multiple times a day to check in on me. And she's already terrified of me getting like kidnapped or murdered. So I was like, okay, this is the last thing I need to tell her because I feel like by telling her it's not going to make it any better. She's just going to make me more scared or she's just going to keep on calling me every minute of the day to check in on me. So I chose not to tell her. Uh, when I found out his identity and when I thought I had the situation under control, that's when I chose to tell her. Uh, and she was pretty mad at me that I hid it from her. And she was really disturbed at what I'd been dealing with. I think a lot of things made sense for her then because there were some nights she was like, what's wrong with you? Like, you seem scared and agitated and stressed out. And I didn't tell her because I, I couldn't really. I couldn't bring myself to tell her. So... Yeah, I'm glad that I finally was able to talk to her about it. 
And now that she's in the loop and knows what's happening, I feel safer because I know that if anything were to happen, I could call her and I could be like, can you come here right now? Can you like call the cops or something? Have you had any other followers or fans online that you've suspected of potentially being stalkers? There have been some followers and fans online that have definitely overstepped boundaries and I've just blocked them. I don't deal with that anymore. I refuse to. If I get anything disturbing, weird, creepy in my comments, in my filtered messages, block, block, like don't even entertain it. Because half the time, most of the time, a lot of these people, they just want to know that they got to you. They want that attention from you. So I've just stopped completely completely engaging. And the police even said with this guy, if he ever texts me again, don't engage, don't message back, just call us, let us know, we'll add it to the file. That's it. Were there certain things that made him escalate? Like every time you posted a YouTube video or when 90 Day Fiance came out on national television, were there things like that that kind of escalated for him? Yeah, absolutely. Anytime I post a video, it would almost happen right after he would send me a text message and he would have something to say about my video ranging from what I was wearing to maybe something I had said about a relationship or about my love life. He would always make commentary on it. And then once the show came out, he seemed pretty upset by the fact that I guess I was, you know, I was dating a girl and he was seemingly angry about that. I'm so fascinated by the whole cyber part of this and everything because, you know, people can kind of hide in anonymity for only so long, but you've gotten a lot further with this than a lot of people have in these cases. So I really want to understand, you know, where you're coming from and and going down that path. So um, if someone were to come to you and say, I want to be a YouTuber, what advice would you give them? If someone came to me and said they wanted to be a YouTuber or an influencer, I would say, be true to yourself and be who you are, but also make sure you keep some things private. You know, having a private life is important. Be as careful about posting your surroundings as you can. But also the, the, the problem is that if somebody really, really, really wants to find you, they're going to find you. It's so easy to nowadays. They can look up so many different things. They can look up tax records. They can look up an MLS listing to see, you know, where you bought a house. I mean, like literally everything. And I've tried to cover my tracks. My mom's a realtor, so she didn't list these things online when I was in the process of purchasing a home in order to help protect me. But there's still ways that people can find out in this day and age with the technology out there. If somebody wants to mess with you, they have so many different ways of doing it. You know, they can go, they can use an app to make a hundred different phone numbers. They can use a voice changing monitor thing. They can use a, you know, they could change their face using an app. Like there's so many just simple things people can do. So I guess be careful when you start doing anything online. There's, there's risk and there's reward. Just like with anything in life, the reward is you get to work for yourself, you work from home, and there is like endless earning potential. But the risk is that, you know, your shit's out there and people are nasty and rude and sometimes people cross the line. How do you think stalking could be taken more serious within the YouTube community? Unfortunately, I think the only time that stalking really gets taken seriously is when somebody ends up hurt or dead or kidnapped. And it should never even have to get that far. I think people need to take it seriously right at the source when it starts to happen. How would you like to see your followers or your fans interact with you? I just, I, I, I wish that people could interact with me as if I were a friend, but not as if they really know me. Be nice, be kind online, but realize that I am a stranger (laughs) and you are a stranger and we don't really know each other. So, you know, I just, I wish people knew boundaries. It's, it's so hard to like 
put put boundaries up because you want to be friendly. You want people to like you. You want to be open and you want to accept people who are your followers and who are generally kind. But then sometimes when you do, you let in the wrong people. And have you ever met a fan or a follower that you did eventually become friends with? I've actually met a handful of people that started off as followers. I mean, my ex-girlfriend was at one point a follower. There's just something a lot less intimidating about a female follower, though. I will say that. Um, There's been a lot of female fans and followers who I've given out my number to and who I've talked to frequently. But sometimes men can scare me. And it's nothing against them, you know, like, I don't want to sound like an asshole and say like, all men suck. But you know, there is something kind of scary and intimidating about a man aggressively pursuing you on the internet. So I hope that guys can kind of see that and realize that that's not okay and back off and know that it's not anything personal. But like, I'm just I'm a single woman. I live by myself. You know, I have to take precautions. Based on online harassment, how do men and women differ in their levels of harassment? Um, Women will just be petty and mean and will leave you comments calling you ugly or fat or whatever. But guys, when they take it to that next level, it can be scary because it's coming from a guy. Um, I'm sure women can be vindictive as well, but... You know, with men, oftentimes it can have a sexual undertone, which is really uncomfortable and scary. I have had, you know, I've had, I've been sexually assaulted in my life. So it's like hearing that, like these text messages, it like, it kind of triggers me because I've had, I've had very scary experiences in my life. And this is, this is reminding me a lot of that. I have issues with intimacy and it's something that I'm currently in therapy for. I have been sexually assaulted in my past. I many, many years ago before I was ever diagnosed with my illness, I had briefly worked as a dancer in Los Angeles and I had one evening where I was sexually assaulted by somebody and, you know, it's kind of something that stayed with me and I I do not move quickly when it comes to intimacy. People that try to be intimate with me very early on will see my knee-jerk reactions. Like someone can put their hand on me and I'll just like jerk away. And I think that's that's something that my partner noticed quickly too. It's like, oh my gosh, like every time like I put my hand near you, you flinch. And I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like it's just, I'm just like a little screwed up. And it's not something that I really talk to people about but it's a it's a problem and for me intimacy takes a lot of time and trust to be built and I need to feel completely comfortable and not pressured at all and unfortunately when you're on a show that's like are you guys in love are you guys fucking are you guys like you know it's like you feel like you're under pressure a lot Um, even though that's not your partner's intention at all they're not pressuring you but you feel the pressure from, you know, we're on a TV show about falling in love. People want us to, (laughs) you know, do the deed and fall in love and whatever. So I think that the show, being on the show, kind of like amplified my anxiety as far as intimacy goes. And it really like psyched me out. So yeah, and it's, and I, I struggle a lot with that even now today. And it sucks because I know that people see me online and they view me as a sexual person based off of the, the photos I post and the videos I post. And so I get worried and nervous meeting people for the first time because I think that that's what they will expect from me and that they might forcefully try to get that from me. So I'm like, I think that's part of the reason why I'm a hermit and I kind of shy away from meeting people nowadays. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about sex and yes, I wear sexy outfits on my Instagram posts and I have an OnlyFans, but that does not dictate 
what you can do with me. And it does not give you any permission over my body. This, you know, it's not giving you consent. I'm actually celibate. I have been celibate for almost two years now. So I'm like, I'm now very assertive, but unfortunately that assertiveness scares people away sometimes. <laughs> so. And what kind of precautions do you take now? How has your life changed from this? I have strongly considered getting a firearm, but I'm still on the fence because I don't know if I want that in my home. Um, I do have that bear spray that I got from Amazon. Somebody recommended it to me. They're like, you should get bear spray. It can take down a 300 pound man. And I was like, okay. So I got some bear spray. Um, I have a security system. I have cameras set up outside of my house with sensors. So if anybody's walking by or if an animal walks by even, it's like I get a notification right away. So I'm like very alert, aware of my surroundings, almost too much, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like, I, I don't need to see all that. I don't need to see the squirrel in my front yard three times a day walking back and forth. But, you know, it makes me feel safe. And, you know, I actually I recommend that every every person should have something like that, especially if you're a woman living alone. And do you know where your stalker is now? He could still be in the general area, but there's also a chance that he could be somewhere else in the United States. Um, the police are trying to track him down as well. So I'm going to get an update soon. I actually did get a message from one of the officers recently, and he says, I have to update you. But he wants to see me in person and tell me what, like, where the investigation is now. What do you want to see happen to him? I don't want anyone to suffer and go to prison or you know, to have to pay thousands of dollars or anything like that. I just want this person to stop, you know? I want to feel safe in my home again. I want to not worry every time I hear something outside. I just want peace of mind. That's all I want. And I don't get peace of mind knowing that somebody's in prison because, you know, eventually they get out and then what, you know? What kind of an emotional toll has all of this taken on you? I think, you know, I have nightmares a lot about it. There was actually two nights ago that I had a dream. And in the dream, he was standing in this little area of my front yard where there's an opening in the woods. And he was just standing there. And in this nightmare, he was taking these notes and he would be putting them around the woods in my house for me to find. And I woke up like sweating, freaked out, like terrified. And you know, it was like 6am that I woke up, it was still a little bit dim outside and my dogs wanted to go out and pee. And I kind of like hesitated to I was really scared. So I checked my cameras before going outside. And it's just things like that little, little changes in my behavior that really make me see how much this guy has kind of screwed with my head. Um, I, I get I, I sleep with my bedroom door locked every single night. And that might be weird or not. I don't know. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I do get scared. What's life like for you now? Um, well, knowing that the cops are helping me out right now, it's actually, it's good. I feel very lucky to be living in the town that I live because I know that police departments vary greatly based on where you're living. And I think because I live in a relatively small, tight-knit community, that, you know, police are much more involved in my case than if I was living in a big city. So I think so far life is life is good. Like nothing's ever perfect, right? Like everybody's got that thing that they got to deal with. So this is that thing. Like I got, I, I'm blessed in other areas of my life. I have two great dogs. I, I have a beautiful home and I love what I do for a living. So, you know, Life has to tip the scales a little bit. It's like, oh, everything's good? Okay, we're going to give you a really shitty stalker just to even that playing field out. <laughs> what have you learned about stalking from this experience? I've learned that, okay, this is going to come as come off as kind of ironic because I'm on a podcast talking about my stalker. But, you know, a lot of YouTubers, a lot of social media influencers will 
talk about their stalkers for entertainment value. And after actually experiencing stalking firsthand, I know that it's not something that's a, that's supposed to be like a fun story. It's something that's scary and that really changes you and changes your life and is something that should be taken seriously. It's not like a fun little anecdote to post on a YouTube channel. It's something really serious. And thankfully for me, it hasn't escalated to a point where I've been, you know, hurt by this person. But so many people have been hurt by their stalkers. So I think, yeah, it's never to be taken lightly. And when somebody is going through a stalking experience, they should be taken seriously by people around them and law enforcement. Do you think there's anything that law enforcement could have done better for you the first time you went in? I think they could have put me in touch with maybe a private investigator. They could have maybe referred me to somebody who could do some kind of cyber work and find out if they could track this person down. Um, I think that they could have maybe tried to make me feel a little bit safer by suggesting more things that I can do um, and giving me just making me feel like I have options, you know, like when the first time the cops left, I was like, okay, like, what do I do? You know, I just, I didn't even know who to call. Like, do I just call 911 every time? So I think that first initial time meeting the cops, it really left me not feeling safe at all. But this second time with the new police department in my in the town that I'm currently in, I feel so much safer. I kind of feel like I feel like more attention is being paid to it. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and, and coming forward. And I know it's always a difficult thing to kind of get into all this, but um, you know, it's exciting that you're actually very close on your case, to be 100% honest with you. It's it's like very few people, especially online stalking, get nearly as far as you have. And also joining us is David Maimon, an associate professor at the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology at Georgia State University. He researches cyber-enabled and cyber-dependent crimes and also co-authored Cybercrime Prevention Theory and Applications. Today he's here to share his thoughts pertaining to Stephanie's case. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. How did you become interested in studying cyber crimes? Well, that, it actually happened by by uh, by chance. Uh, when I graduated, I, I really uh, you know, my, my PhD is in sociology. I didn't want to uh, pursue an academic career as a criminologist or sociologist. I actually wanted to just leave it all and go to Australia and pursue another PhD in marine biology. But then my wife told me that if I did that, she would leave me. So, you know, I had to find, uh, you know, uh, another way to support my family as well as do something that I'm really interested in, uh, interested in and that will allow me to um, expose new things. And so uh, I decided to dive into the cybercrime uh, field. Can you elaborate on some of the cybercrimes that you research? Uh, our group studies uh, many different types of cybercrime. Cybercrime, again, is a, is a very uh, broad concept that encompasses many different types of uh, crimes, uh, including hacking, but also cyberbullying and DDoS attacks and uh, writing malicious software and um, cyber stalking, of course. Um, our group focuses on uh, studying many of those um, offenders as well as victims. So we study hackers. We study uh, online fraudsters. We study online extremists, uh, online drug dealers. Um, of course, we study darknet vendors, um, darknet customers. There is some research indicating that um, uh, you know, cyber criminals tend to be more obsessive. Uh, they tend to have low level uh, of self-control. Some research says that they have high level of self-control. Some research suggests that um, many online criminals uh, tend to be narcissists. How would someone like Stephanie, who's you know in the public eye, identify a follower who could potentially be a stalker? Is that even possible? It's it's. I don't think it's impossible uh, doing this the first time that uh, someone is following you on Twitter or Instagram or, or YouTube. Uh, you know, I think it's it will be ridiculous for me to say that it is impossible. I mean, it's it's very problematic to predict someone's behaviors based on. Uh, one interaction that you had with him. And the, the interaction is actually happening online and it's a link, it's a like, I'm sorry, or, a, or a, uh, you know, either 
a nice post or even a nasty post. I mean, it's very difficult to predict uh, that that individual will end up uh, to be a stalker. I think that uh, you definitely need to engage with individuals over time in order to be able to um, uh, hopefully come up with a set of predictors that will uh, allow you to understand whether that individual will become a stalker or not. But that requires a lot of time and, and a lot of investment in, in communicating with those individuals. So what do you think that her stalker's ideal goal was? Do you think it was to make her fear him, to get her attention, to make her life miserable, to cause her harm? I mean, do you think they're seeking validation or maybe a combination of all? When you talk to these guys online, you understand that there's no, there's really no one motivation uh, behind their behavior. It's, it's a slew, it's an array of things that push them to behave uh, in a specific way. Um, again, without talking to the guy, it's very difficult uh, for me to say what was his motivation. Uh, I think it's a combination of everything you just mentioned, uh, the attention, the fact that maybe the guy was um, you know, getting thrilled by the fact that Stephanie was uh, intimidated um, and petrified by the emails he sent. Um, you know, who knows? Unless, unless we talk to him, we'll never know. What do you think the first thing Stephanie could have done differently would have been um, right off the bat? Take her phone for an expert, trying to figure out whether she has a malicious software on it. Uh, if it, you know, if it had a malicious software in it, uh, if, if it would, uh, if, if the expert would have said that there was a malicious software in it, clean it. If not, I would have recommend potentially um, getting a new phone with a new number, uh, because to me it seems like someone hacked her. Um, you know, it could be that the individual simply um, was able to lure her to click on a link, on an email, on a phishing link that uh, in turn downloaded a malicious software to her smartphone or computer or whatever technology she was using. And then, um, you know, once, once the malicious software embedded itself, uh, the spyware embedded itself on the, on the device, the individual could have gotten all the information she mentioned uh, during the podcast, like the dinner she was having with family or uh, you know, her driving in her car, right? I mean, if, if, that, if, if that individual was essentially on the smartphone, all he had to do was just, just click on a, a button and then simply record everything she was doing. Is it really that easy for a, a hacker to just, you click a link and they're in all your stuff? Yeah, it is. Uh, so this is one of the, I mean, we engage a lot with hackers. We conduct a lot of hacking uh, and hackers research. And you'd be amazed when the hackers first took over the, the device, they turned on the camera and then they turned on the mic, right? In order to really try and figure out who owns the computer and whether they can get some really cool information, right? About the individuals they are targeting, right? So I think that speaks volume to, and these are not really sophisticated hackers, right? I mean, in, in this experiment, the hackers were not the state level hackers that we're talking, we're talking like script kiddies, People with, you know, very low level of experience, they just had the malicious software that allowed them access to someone's computer. Yeah, that's pure stalking in my book. So those those scary movies that we see where someone's on the other side of the computer and they're, you know, watching you walk around your house and stuff, that's real? That's real. How do you know if someone has put this software on your phone or your computer? <laughs> uh, that's the million dollar question, <laughs> Jamie, you know? Uh, you have the best minds working on answering this question uh, constantly, right? Uh, but it's it's very difficult, right? I mean, you have to understand how malicious software work in this sense uh, and how antivirus sort of works. So the, the technology that will allow you to identify the spyware or the malicious software is the antivirus. And the way antivirus work is like, I mean, it, it, it's like, uh, uh, identifying signatures on the on the malicious software. So imagine someone breaking into your house. The police will come. They will dust for fingerprints to make you you know feel better. Uh, but then they will take the fingerprints or whatever they they were able to excavate from your apartment and they will run it in their database in order to try and figure out whether there's a match or not. Antivirus uh, work very similar, right? I mean, uh, different. Uh, uh, malicious software that we are aware of, they have different signatures. And so once we are aware 
of a signature and the antivirus has the signature in the, da in the database, it will flag the existence of a virus. But what happens if there's no signature? Then you will never know that you have someone on a computer, that you have malicious software on your computer, um, but then you have a ghost on, on your system. So, you know, unfortunately, I can't really, uh, th that, that is the answer to the, to the uh, question. And it's not really, it's not a really happy one. Um, you know, it's difficult to uh, identify when you have someone in the system. Do you feel that social media platforms could do a better job combating cyber stalking? And, you know, if they could, how would they go about doing it? You know, I think that at the end of the day, it's not only on the social media platform. I think, you know, social media platform is just one place where actors can get all the information that they can use. But, you know, if you think about that, the government released a lot of information on you as well. I mean, if you buy a house, then your address, your name, your mortgage, all the sensitive information that you don't want anyone to know about is out there and everybody can get it, right? So people will be, I mean, if, if, if they will look for your name, they will be able to know, uh, you know, where you live, uh, who you're married to, how much money you owe to the bank. And all this information is not on social media. So, you know, maybe social media can do better, but is this the solution for cyber stalking? I, I'm not sure, you know. Um, I think, you know, the better solution is, and if you want to take social media into consideration, the better solution is for us to be more careful about what it, what is it that we put out there. People can use the information you put on social media to know whether you're in your home or not, and then get into your house physically and steal stuff, right? And, and we know that cases like that essentially happen. So in my mind, the better solution is not necessarily the social media platform who may or may not can do better, but you know, we need to be more careful about the content that we uh, post on social media platforms. How equipped do you feel that most police departments are dealing with cyber stalking? <laughs> They're really not. <laughs> if you if you think about it, yeah. unfortunately, at the local level, I, I don't think that uh, uh, law enforcement has the skills, the tools, the know-how to deal with cyber stalking. And I think, you know, the the uh, response that uh, Stephanie got uh, the first time she went to the police is the most common response cyber stalking victims experience when they uh, call the police and tell them, hey, you know, someone is stalking me. Um Unless you have evidence, uh, unless you have concrete name, right, about uh, a potential suspect, someone who you know for sure is talking to you, there's really uh, nothing the police can do in order to help you. Uh, that's unfortunate, but that's the case. Um, how can we change that with how the police deal with stalkers and cyber stalking? We need to allocate more resources to uh, local police. We need to train them. Um, Again, I mean, we're talking about cyber stalking and, and, and online fraud, but, you know, I can tell you that uh, local police is experiencing difficulties being on the dark net where uh, people are selling or, or, or uh, shipping guns and, and drugs and all these, you know, illegal commodities to their community, communities and, and, you know, they don't know what to do with them. So, you know, I think that at the end of the day, there, there's got to be this, uh, you know, realization among law enforcement that, uh, you know, online crime is here to stay for, you know, long period of time. We need to allocate more resources uh, in order for us to really understand, uh, you know, the criminals, understand the victims, uh, understand how we gather intelligence uh, in order to help prevent these types of crime. Um, as well as how we get our evidence in order to get as close as we can to offender and then prosecute them. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. If anyone out there is in need of help or is a victim of stalking, please reach out. You can find a list of resources on our Instagram at Strictly Stalking Pod. You can watch our episodes at youtube.com slash Strictly Stalking. And now we're on Patreon where you can sign up for exclusive bonus episodes, live chat sessions, and check out show merchandise. Just go to patreon.com slash Strictly Stalking. I'm Jake Deptula. And I'm Jamie Beebe. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of Strictly Stalking. Strictly Stalking.